The middle part of this chapter, chapter 15, talks about how vesicles move around within the space of a cell. So vesicular transport is the theme for the next four and a half pages. So vesicles move between organelles as illustrated in this figure. It's very important that you realize what the pink arrows refer to as well as the green arrows. So let's go for the simple example first. So entry into the cell by endocytosis. So whether this is pinching off small amounts of membrane or pinching off large amounts of membrane, as in the case of a white blood cell, the entry of the vesicle here ends up at a location along the green pathway. So there is no way that the endosome, the endosome will end up fusing with the Golgi or the endoplasmic reticulum or any other part of the endomembrane system other than the lysosome. This is a protective measure to stop the cell from becoming infected by pathogens via this pathway. So once the vesicle is formed, it then fuses with vesicles arriving from one part of the Golgi to form larger structures. And these larger structures, they mature as time passes from an early endosome to a late endosome. And the main difference between the two is their chemical content. So the chemical constituents of these sacs, they begin to change. And eventually a late endosome will become a lysosome or fuse with an existing lysosome that's already matured within the cytosol. The alternative pathway begins at the endoplasmic reticulum. And this is a one-way passage towards the Golgi apparatus. And this side of the Golgi is called the cis, C-I-S. And this side of the Golgi is called the trans, T-R-A-N-S. And in some books, this part of the Golgi is called the medial or the middle. So there is a distinct pathway of movement across the Golgi apparatus. And these arrows indicate how vesicles bud off from one cisterni and fuse with the next in a sequential manner. And the biochemistry of these sacs is changing constantly as the products mature. Eventually, vesicles are pinched off to travel down two alternative pathways. The first pathway does not end at the membrane of the cell. It does fuse with the incoming vesicles to form endosomes and eventually form lysosomes. And you can see there's no direct passage between a lysosome and the Golgi or the lysosome and the endoplasmic reticulum. The second pathway from the Golgi goes through transport vesicles and ends up fusing with the cell membrane, the plasma membrane. And here the membrane of the vesicles can fuse with the plasma membrane or the contents of the vesicles can be exported out of the cell through exocytosis. The focus for these few pages is for students to learn how these vesicles are formed known as budding, and how they make their way to their destinations. So let's start at the beginning. This figure here taken from your textbook is a electromicrograph showing a real cell forming a vesicle. So you can see a membrane, and it doesn't matter which membrane this is, uh, a membrane in the cell begins to invaginate, fold inwards. And as it time passes, the degree of folding increases until eventually it forms a open sac. And if you wait a few seconds more, the open sac will be pinched off from the existing membrane to form a vesicle. There's a lot of detail in this micrograph. We can see the contents of the vesicle inside, the dark matter. We can see the membrane 
of the vesicle, the lipid bilayer, and we can see proteins attached in the region just outside to the external cytosolic membrane leaflet. And in this figure here, taken from a different angle, we're looking down now on the surface of these vesicles. We can see that each vesicle, and there are different sizes here, each vesicle is coated with a network of protein molecules. Utilizing imagery like these cartoons will help us understand how the bud in the previous diagram formed. So here in this case we have the plasma membrane because of this label, but this could apply to any other membrane within the cell. So the important thing is that we have four different colored entities right here in terms of proteins or cargo molecules. So the cargo molecules bind to their protein receptors. So the red dots are the ligands, and they could be hormones or food molecules or something else that the cell needs to import. So once they bind to their cargo receptors, the cargo receptors are concentrated into the budding zone, the invagination zone, by binding to a protein illustrated here in light green called adaptin. So that adaptin protein captures the cargo receptor molecules and prevents them from drifting away. And as the concentration of these cargo molecules begins to increase on the inside of the cell, the adaptin binds also to a second type of protein. And in this particular case, it's called clathrin. Clathrin. So the four, pro the, four, the three proteins and the cargo molecules are then beginning to assemble with neighboring molecules. And the curvature of the clathrin automatically causes the membrane to be pulled inwards. And this is an en energy utilizing process. So lots of GTP and lots of ATP will be used, but that's not important right now. Due to the physical shape of the clathrin coat, the surface of the vesicle begins to further invaginate, forming this bud. And the neck of the bud has to be then de detached from the bud itself, and that cannot take place because the clathrin doesn't have enough energy to do that. So assistance is needed for many other proteins, one of which is this one called dynamin. And dynamin uses GTP energy to drive itself into a tight constriction, which then finally pinches off the membrane between the vesicle and the original mother membrane from which the vesicle originates. Now we have a vesicle coated with proteins on the outside. And these proteins are recycled by being removed and then utilized again for further invagination. Once the vesicle is denuded of its proteins, it is then sent on its way, normally along some cytoskeleton components of the cell. Within typical cells, there are a number of different types of protein coats that can be applied to different types of vesicles. And in our textbook, we look at three categories, just three, there's many more. So the first type of vesicle is called a clathrin coated vesicle. Now you may notice that the second row has the same wording. Well, the difference lies here. So the adaptin molecule, the one that links the cargo molecule to the clathrin, that has two different forms. So in the first type of clathrin coated adaptin one type of coat, that originates in the Golgi apparatus, and then it makes its way to the lysosomes via the endosomes. So that's the only pathway along which you will find adaptin 1 you being utilized inside vesicles. An alternative pathway uses adaptin 2, and that location is between the plasma membrane and the endosomes. So only for that part of the journey. And then finally, we have the cop-coated um, vesicles and they originate at the ER and travel 
into and between the parts of the Golgi apparatus. And their destination is within that roaming range. So we go back to this figure, we should be able to then identify where those three particular coated protein vesicles would operate. So I'll leave that up to the student to check. We shall see in subsequent chapters how vesicles travel through different parts of the cell to different destinations. But for now, imagine that we're nearing the end of that journey. We're getting to our destination. So what happens at the destination? Well, we already discussed earlier that the vesicle is denuded of its cytoplasmic proteins. So what happens once it arrives at its destination? Well, that's a complicated pathway too. And there's a number of things going on here. So we already know about the red cargo protein, which has now been turned brown by the authors for some reason. And then we also have the cargo receptor protein. We haven't mentioned the other two types of protein that are important in this situation. One is called a snare. And the snares occur in two versions. They're the blue versions, which are the target snares on the target membrane. And then we have the V snares, which refer to the vesicle snares. And there's many, many types of these that are unique to that particular location. So this snare and this snare are complementary and they will be present for this type of vesicle to dock with this membrane here. And finally, we have other proteins that are very important. And these proteins, in this case, are called RAB proteins at RAB. And the RAB proteins are instrumental in tethering the vesicle to a tethering protein um, in green in this case. And that uses energy. So RAB is also a, a G TPAs. Once the, the RAB has grabbed the tethering protein, then the tethering, the te the tethering protein uh, will undergo some conformational changes, bringing the V snare in close proximity to the T snare. And the two snares will start raveling around each other, just like a pair of garbage ties. And as they get tighter and tighter, they pull the vesicle onto and merge it with the target membrane. Uh, the actions of the snares are better illustrated in figure 1522. So they've left out everything else except for concentrating on what happens with the snares. So as the snares get tangled up, they use energy from within the cytosol to pull the vesicle close to the target membrane. And as this mechanical maneuver takes place, the lipid molecules are opposed to each other and water is excluded. So water is excluded because of the action of the snares. And once the water molecules are excluded, the lipid molecules, the phospholipid molecules of the two membranes are free to intermingle. And that leads to the fusion of the vesicle with the target membrane. And you can see here, the vesicle membrane now joins the target membrane. And this will then unravel slightly. This part will go to the left, and this part will move to the right. And the vesicle will become a contiguous part of that membrane. Now the contents, the lumen of the vesicle, that content will be excluded out into this space, wherever that space may be. And that's what happens at the destination.